Turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and this week we're really going to be beginning in uh, verse 22 to 222. And if you'll remember with me, we have 120 disciples, 12 apostles, all in the upper room. They were waiting on the promise of the Father. Uh, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit come and we could see and hear it, it, you could see tongues of fire upon their heads you could hear a, a, a mighty wind but there was no damage nothing was burned nothing was burned I didn't even have my mic on that's a nice way to start And there came an accusation. After everyone heard them speaking in their own dialects, there was an accusation of them being drunk, of them being filled with new wine. And of course, when there's a mocking and an accusation, the accuser of the brother is the devil, and so there has to be a defense. And so Peter stands up and gives it a defense. Now really, I want you to understand this, that this is so much more than what you could ever imagine going on. The first sermon, the church is birthed, and instantly the accuser of the brethren attacks and says, this is really not the work of God. This is not the promise of God. This is not the baptism of the Spirit. And he makes an indictment against those who just become the church, the ecclesia, the new work of God, the first fruits that to follow because Jesus has fallen to the ground. And unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, he cannot produce any grain. And here we see the birth of more grain. And instantly, the enemy brings this indictment. Well, with an indictment, there has to be a defense. And with a defense, there has to be witnesses and testimony. And then there's going to be people that are called. I mean, this is all a courtroom battle that we have to understand is going on. Not just at this first sermon, but in your life, in my life, there is a courtroom battle going on to do the will of God. What are you going to do during your 70, 80 years on this planet poetically with the will of God? See, there is a testament that has been written, a testimony of God Almighty. And in order for that will to be done, in order for it to be carried out, we've rehearsed this before, the courtroom drama, somebody has to die. Jesus the Christ came, the testator, and died. So that the will of God could be done. Behold, it is written in the volume of the books, I have come to do thy will, O God. It's a written document. It's, it's a document that tells us what God wants to do with all of his property. And it's all his. He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. And Christ inherited it all when he did the will of God. You and I, when we believe he did the will of God and he paid for the sins of the world with his blood, we receive that inheritance. We become joint heirs. And he sends back another, it tells us in the text, the executor of the estate, the Holy Spirit, who begins to take the will of God and he begins to use it in your life if you'll listen. And the gifts are given and the inheritance is given. And it's all being handed out by the Holy Spirit if we do it according to the Word of God. I told this story when my mother passed away. I talked to you about this courtroom drama. That I was her POA. I was her power of attorney. That's the law. The power of attorney. It kept people in line. You were able to do it while they were still alive. You could use the power of attorney to handle their articles, their, their business. And God's business was handled by the law prior to the coming of Christ. But as soon as I went to the bank, as soon as my mom passed away, I got the certificate of death. I went to the bank and I said, I'd like to withdraw uh, this money that my mom has so I could begin to take care of her first. And she goes, 
you get a death certificate? And I go, I said that wrong. I had the POA is all I had. And they go, well, that's useless. Once somebody's dead, now the will goes into effect and you need a certificate of death to prove that they're dead and then you can begin to act if you are the administrator of her estate. I was like, wow. And see, now that Christ has died, yea, risen, we know he is risen. It's going to be the central theme. It's the heart of the first sermon. But now we're led by the administrator, by the will of God perfectly. Not the letter of the law, which kills, but by the spirit of God, which gives life. That's what we're being led by now. That's why it's a love relationship. That's why it's not a, I just do this on Sunday thing. That's why it's an all day long, every day, all for the rest of our life thing. That's why he's completing the work in us until the day of Christ Jesus. So you have this courtroom drama. This courtroom battle that's going on where witnesses are being called. Testimony is being given. And listen to me. The devil doesn't want us to give testimony. The devil doesn't want us to give witness. The devil doesn't want us to answer the mockers and the accuser of the brethren. The devil wants us to sit around like we do not have answers. But every answer we need is here, contained in this book. 66 books by 40 authors, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. And it's all done by faith. It's all by faith. Faith. You don't see faith unless you see the evidence of faith. It's Hebrews 11 1 says... Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There's evidence when a person's living by faith. There's going to be evidence when we're walking by faith. There's going to be a substance there afterward that shows that you're being a witness, that you're a living testimony of God. I'm a little bit ahead of myself, so I'm going to pray and we'll get started. Father, pray that you would... Allow me to present this word in a way that would be pleasing to you, that would grow people up, and that we would understand the veracity of your scriptures. We would understand the work of your spirit, that we would see the depth of what you've done for us. And we would surrender in a way that would be meaningful to be a witness and give testimony for all that you've done, you're doing, and you're going to do. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So this young fisherman, Peter, who 53 days prior denies knowing the Christ after the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he receives the spirit of promise, stands up to answer the accuser the indictment that is against him, to give a defense for the hope that is within him. And if you rehearsed last week's, he quotes out of Joel. Notice all of his defense. Everything that he says is going back and giving testimony of what God's already done, what God's already said. It goes back to his word. It's following the pattern of Jesus the Christ. He's following his pattern of using the word of God to defend and anytime you're living your life and you're telling people things and the Bible doesn't defend it, you better be careful. There's a lot of new gospels going on out there. There's a lot of new things in the church going on out there. In fact, because of all the old things that were going on and the tradition that people got stuck in and the apostasy that they fell in, now everybody's changing the name of their church because they don't even want to be associated with with the apostate churches. So they want to make sure that they let people know that we're no longer that. And they're trying to do what? They're trying to change their image. They're trying to change the way they look. They're trying to change the stereotypes that the devil has put upon them. And yea, their living has put upon them. Because it's not the word of God. Listen, God does not change. He's the unchanging one. 
It's not about the name on the building. It's about the blood on your heart. It's not about the way you live when you get to the building as you evangelize the pews. It's about how you live when you're out being a witness and giving testimony. What are you talking about? Who are you representing? And yet we've made it all about the building. The building has nothing to do with church. We don't even need a building. That's culturanity. We don't need businesses, budgets, and buildings. That's the work of man's hands. What we need is surrendered vessels that call upon the name of the Lord and are ready to enter into the ministry of reconciliation and the saving of souls. And so Peter stands up by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit allows him to give this dissertation, this defense from the book of Joel we covered last week to tell them exactly what was going on. And then he addresses them further in verse 22. We're going to read it again, not to be tedious, but it's good for us to hear the word of God. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow the Holy One to to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Set at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Listen. Powerful. Something just happened that's never happened before. They're all in Jerusalem for a festival, and all of a sudden, it's a ninth hour, and they hear this huge wind, and they're like, what is going on? And they come up on it, and they said, they're drunk. The indictment from the accuser. And the Spirit of God comes upon Peter and he tells them what is going on. He tells them that this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And then he continues in verse 22 to make sure that he puts down a complete defense so that they will understand. He gives the testimony of Scripture. And then he's really going to render to them the conclusion 
And listen, it's up to you to come up with the verdict. It's up to you to choose this day whom you're going to serve. One day, the Father is going to bring down the gavel. One day, in this giant courtroom drama, there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ. And you're either going to go to the Bema seat because you believed and trusted in the blood, or you're going to go to the white throne judgment because you rejected the testimony of Almighty God through His church, His bride. His believer priest, his children, his body. We become so many things. It's amazing how many things we become as we receive the inheritance with Christ. Men of Israel, men that are governed by God, that's what Israel means. Hear, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. These words, Jesus of Nazareth. Make sure you know there's a lot of Jesus is being preached out there. This one specifically points to Jesus of Nazareth, the one that was crucified. Did you guys hear that joke where a family had drove away from their house and he sees this guy creeping up on the house and as he's trying to open the back window, the parrot says, I see you and Jesus sees you. The guy's like, what? Bust the window out. Again, he hears, I see you and Jesus sees you. The guy just looks around and there's nobody around. So he's like, where is that coming from? He crawls in the house. He stands up and the parrot says again, I see you and Jesus sees you. And he looks. And there's a big black Doberman standing there named Jesus. <laughs> Listen, that's funny. But in your faith, if you're serving a different Jesus, it's not funny anymore. It must be Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, the Lord, is salvation. Yeshua, Jehovah. It's the, it's, the, it's the provision that God has sent for us to wash away the stain that's upon the sin nature and give us new life. Which Jesus will you be testifying of? Which Jesus will you be following? That's an important thing to know. Listen, it's a testimony. Paul says, test yourself to see if you're even in the faith. Many people have come to a church, and they're, they're part of a church, and they're warming their hands by the fire, yet in their life they do exactly what Peter did. They deny knowing the Christ. But then they have a chance for the Spirit to come upon them and truly have salvation when they come to know this Jesus that Peter is testifying of now as he becomes a rock, as a witness. This Jesus of Nazareth, look, a man, need to know he came in the flesh, because there's liars out there that say he was only spirit, attested by God. Attested is, is the word approved in the King James, but it really means this. It means an exhibit. It means to show off, to demonstrate, to prove, to set forth. But listen, it's an exhibit. Jesus was an exhibit in this courtroom battle. When you call testimonies, you also have exhibit A, exhibit B. You have different exhibits. And Jesus was the first exhibit. He's exhibit A. Well, how did he exhibit who he was? Attested, exhibited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Now listen, it wasn't done in the dark. He didn't travel very far from Jerusalem. He was right there. All of them listening knows that he did miracles, signs, and wonders. They know it. They believe it. They've seen it. In fact, most of them yelled, uh, Hosanna, Hosanna. And by the end of the week, they said, crucify him, crucify him. And now, he's just sharing with them the truth that they already know because they've seen the exhibit of Christ. They've seen the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. 
Listen, the miracles means, it's the, it's, the, it's the word dunamis, it's the word miraculous power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And Jesus was full of the Spirit without measure. He was given us a living exhibit, a living example of how to be led by the Spirit in everything that he did. And this right here where it says these three things attested to Jesus and who he was. Miracles is the first one. And it means a mighty, wonderful work. It's the miracle itself as you see it. But then, and I didn't give you this last week, but I want to give it to you. Then you have wonders. And see, the reason sometimes I don't give this guy, I go, oh my goodness, this almost hurts my brain. But we need to know this stuff. We need to learn this stuff. And, and as you hear it, if it doesn't do you any good, then just move on to the next point and just hang on. Don't just fog over on me. Wonders means this. When you look it up, it is a prodigy or an omen. See, because listen, when I read that, I go, huh? I don't know what no prodigy is. I'm from Kentucky. What's an omen? I don't get that. And we've confused it with movies. We've confused it with other languages and things that we talk about. And we've changed it. Listen to this. A prodigy is anything out of the ordinary process of nature and so extraordinary as to excite wonder and astonishment. That's what a prodigy is. I would have never known that. So it's out of the ordinary of nature and it's so extraordinary that it excites wonder and astonishment in your understanding of things. And the sign is a mark to indicate. A sign is a mark to indicate. Look up here. It'll tell you something about something that you don't know. That's what a sign is. See this wall? Brown paint. A sign now will tell you something different. If there's a sign here that says wet paint. Now you know more about that wall than you knew just by looking at it. And so in the exhibit, God was saying about Jesus that, that the wonders and the signs that he did tells us something far more about him than what it really could be noticed just by hanging out with him. Because he was no comeliness about him. He didn't stand out. He wasn't head and shoulders above like the first king Saul was that was rejected. He didn't, he didn't uh, come in and was glowing like the Catholic pictures show because he really wasn't. Or they would have said, get the one that's glowing when they went to arrest him. There was nothing except for his words, his testimony, his witness, and the work of the Spirit that caused them to say. They, remember they sent soldiers to arrest him and they come back and they go, he's like, why didn't you arrest him? He's like, no one ever spoke like that. They couldn't even arrest him. There was such power in his word. So it's a testing. And they all seen the signs, the miracles, the wonders. They seen, the apostles seen him walk on water. They seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. Listen, he later, he raises himself from the dead. God raised him. He's God. It's an interesting thought. Hurt my brain when I thought about it. it. Took me two or three days to think about that. But it's true. So everything that he did on exhibit, on the planet, in the courtroom that you and I are in, in front of people, was attesting to him being the Messiah. Was attesting to him being the provision of God for the sin nature that we were born in. And he did it through Miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. They go, yep, yep, we've seen him do it. We've seen him do it. So what does it do? It tells you that not only is he there, it's, it's, it's a wonder. It's, it's beyond the process of nature. It's extraordinary and exciting to raise Lazarus from the dead. So he must be Lord of the living and the dead. He must be able to defeat death. If he can do that, he raised somebody from the dead. So it tells us a whole lot about him. He must be God in the flesh. God with us, Emmanuel. 23. Further, or, uh, Peter further goes on with his defense of what is going on. Him, Jesus of Nazareth, being delivered by the determinate 
counsel, the King James says, mine says purpose, and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Now listen, I could spend the next 10 months on that text. That's powerful. That's why I said it's a work of the devil that we have a halfway empty church and people are someplace else when we're looking at the most powerful defense of the gospel, the first sermon of the church, and people don't show up. And I'm not picking on people for not showing up. I'm just saying it's a work of the devil to give them something else to do when they don't realize the, the, the excitement. They don't realize the, the truth that can be revealed as we study the scripture in this place and how we're supposed to live and be equipped to go out and be a witness. Jesus was delivered, given over is what the word means. Listen to this. It means to surrender. God surrendered him. Listen to this. It's the word. It's translated yielded. He was yielded over. What's that mean? Well, when you have a yield after you plant a crop, you have produce. He was yielded over so that he could die and fall to the ground. Because unless a seed dies, it cannot produce any grain. So there was yield that comes because he was delivered over. Notice on the other side, there's going to be some stuff going on. But how was it done, Greg? By the determinate counsel. Determinate means the decree, the ordination, the appointment of God. But through counsel, listen to this. It says purpose in mind. It means through the volition, but it also means through the will of God. See, it's already written. There's a testimony written of the will of God. It's not what he wants us to do. There's an entire will. It's a written document of how we should live. And the Holy Spirit is now using that to direct you and I. We can't just make up church and be church and say, I'm church and never do the will of God. Never read the Word of God, which it shows us the will of God and who the testator is. This is all a courtroom battle where there's an accuser, the devil, and there's a defense attorney, which is Jesus, who is standing in our corner. He took our death. He laid down his life for us. He said, set them go. Let them go. They're free. I paid that, Father. And the judge comes down with the gavel and says, not guilty. And you say, wow not guilty but I know I just did that I just did that so I got to have some type of guilt no Jesus took it all now your conscience is still thinking oh there's some guilt here so what do you do you confess it before God you agree with him that it was wrong and he washes you and cleanses you from all unrighteousness this is called sanctification this is called us becoming more like Christ. Positionally, we're already seated in heavenly places with him. We're finished. Finished products. But God is working on taking us into and conforming us to the image of the living God. And conforming us into the image of Christ. I've said it a million times. I'll say it again. When the child of God looks into the word of God and sees the son of God, he's transformed by the spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. One of the most amazing statements I ever heard outside of the Bible. But when you're reading scripture, you look for the Son of God. He's on every page. It's all about his testimony. And then it's all about the testimony of people who listened and believed him and then followed him. That's how we witness was given testimony. First, we have to be called, though, don't we? Don't you have to be called? So you raise your right hand and say, hey, you swear to the truth, tell, swear to tell the truth, don't do nothing about the truth. Tell me God, I do. It's all a courtroom battle, people. Are you going to listen to the defense attorney and, and, and choose Barabbas, the son of the father? That's what Barabbas means. You choose the wrong God, choose the wrong Jesus, choose the wrong son. Or are you going to listen to the testimony of the Holy Spirit and choose Jesus of Nazareth? So, according to God's counsel, his will determinate counsel, and don't miss this, foreknowledge. Don't miss foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is forethought or to know beforehand, to foresee. Foreknowledge. 
You have to understand that God's altogether not like us and that he never learns anything. You and I can learn something new and should learn something. We should always be on the grow. We should learn something new every single day, especially about the power of the resurrection, especially about this resurrected life that died for us. We're going to get to that, I hope. That's why I dropped that in there like a little piece of candy for you to think about. Listen to me. God never learns anything. He already knows. Remember our last sermon? And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered from the sin nature, shall be saved. Have you called upon him? Because he's going to call you. That's what happens at the end of this sermon. At the end of this indictment, there's a verdict given. And all that called upon him, because of his foreknowledge once again, he calls on them. See, many are called, but few are chosen. Get this right, because you don't want to lose this, because they're lying to you other places. You hear the testimony. The Holy Spirit comes alongside, Paracletus alongside, and he convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. And now you have to decide with your free will, am I going to choose this Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, who paid for my sin nature with his blood on the cross at Calvary? It's a decision that every person alone must make. And there's no name under heaven and earth that can, you can be saved by but Jesus. With your free will, now you make this verdict and you choose to believe. And guess what? It's a whomsoever gospel. The Bible's clear on that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever shall believe shall not perish but have everlasting life. You call on him through his foreknowledge. Now he comes and chooses you. Why? Because why would he choose somebody he knows that's never going to call on him? You hear the message. You're pricked in your conscience. You believe it. So he comes and he calls you. He sends ministering angels, Hebrews 2 tells us, to protect you until the day that you come to salvation because he already knew you called. He's not going to let the devil destroy you now. That's how much he loves you. That's how he chose you. He didn't choose you and not choose other people. He gives everybody the right. Why would Jesus say, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest if you really didn't have no ability to come to him? What he's saying is he gives everybody, everybody ever born the choice to call upon him. Remember, that was to invoke, to invite, to incite his blood upon your account. That was coming and having all your debt wiped away, and it's up to you. But then because by his foreknowledge, he looks forward and sees that you did, then he chooses you. Somewhere in eternity past, he chose you before the foundations of the earth. And that's how he predestined you, to become conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8, 29. So here, this is what he did the same way, foreknowledge, let me explain it a little bit better, because we don't understand it, do we? Foreknowledge. You're watching a football game today. And tomorrow morning, you go into work and you bet somebody money that the Colts lost again. Sure bet. Sure bet. And that's why I went that way. I'm teasing. My point is, you've already watched the game. You have foreknowledge to what happened, and now you're trying to bet on it. With that type of knowledge, you can't lose. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like watching a parade on one corner, and you see the whole parade go by, and you go, man, that was a good parade. So you drive clear down to the other end uh, of the city, and you watch the parade start to come again. And now you can tell people everything that's going on in the parade because you already watched it. You have foreknowledge. For, you foresee it because you've seen it already. That's the way God is, and we just don't get it. But he'll give you that wisdom. He can give you foreknowledge. It's called a word of knowledge in the Bible. It's a gift that can be given. Because the Holy Spirit knows everything too. And he's the one that administers gifts. So God delivered, ordained Jesus of Nazareth by the determinate counsel, his will, and foreknowledge. I was looking for my note on God. See, this is theos. 
The word God there is theos. It means that the supreme deity. Theos. That would be the Godhead. You have taken, now listen to this indictment. They have been indicted. He's given defense. And now he has given back to them what they did. Him being delivered, so God knew what was going on. It wasn't a surprise. Determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You have taken. Can you see him? Look at the power. Denies Christ. Oh, you're one of them. Your, your speech betrays you. I am not. 53 days before. Now he's pointing at him. You. You have taken him. He's, he, he's, he's pointing at them. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. It actually says slain in the King James. Sometimes I point back to that. I like the new King James. It reads easier for me. And even the old King James can have some issues that don't follow up with what I like to read. So look at this. You have taken. They took him. They arrested him. Mock trial at night, falsely accused before two high priests when there's only supposed to be one because one's appointed by Roman government, by lawless hands. King James says wicked hands. You know what it means when you look it up? It means not subject to Jewish law. Not subject to Jewish law. So they turned them over to Pilate because they were getting ready to celebrate Passover and they didn't want to have unclean hands. So they turned them over to some wicked people that weren't subject to the Passover or to the Jewish laws. And had them crucified. And have crucified, put to death. Slain. How many ways can you say it? The important thing is, though, is look, 24. Whom God raised up. Third day he rose again, didn't he? Who God raised up. It means to stand up again, to raise from the dead. Stand up again. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Really? Loosed the pains of death. Dissolved to melt away. To loosen the pains of death. Now listen, it's really important you understand this. The pains there, it means sorrow or travail. Listen, it's, it's pronounced travail. It's translated travail over in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. When it talks about the day of the Lord. The coming day of the Lord that we talked about last week. It says this is the beginning of birth pains. Same word. It's the beginning of travails. Why? Because God is coming back. The day of the Lord is the day that the church will be raptured out. That's what begins with a new day. And he begins to pour out his wrath upon the enemies of the cross that are going to be under his feet. And that's the day of the Lord. But when he comes back and raptures the church, that's the beginning. When we see the signs, that's the beginning of that same pains. What death? It's loosened from Christ. The death is. It was not possible for them to hold him. Why was it not possible for them to hold him? Greg, I'm glad you asked. Oh, there's a couple good reasons. One is, is God cannot lie, and he put it in Scripture. And he's getting ready to give him that defense. Two is, the reward, the wages of sin, is death. Right? And Christ has no sin. So the grave can't hold him. It's a physical and spiritual law that cannot be broken because God cannot lie. So the grave can't hold him. There's no way for it to hold him. He has no sin. It's not possible. Listen. 
the scripture is confined us all into sin, so we have death. We're born dead, really. We're born dead. And when we come to Christ, he gives us life, and it's as if we've stood up again. Because part of resurrection is to regain or to, to come to spiritual truth. That's part of resurrection because we are actually spirits with a body, not bodies with a spirit. It's not possible. I want to tell you a scenario that I was thinking of today, and I was like, what? Because I do that a lot when I'm thinking, and God starts speaking to me. And I go, what? And my wife's like, what's wrong? I'm like, you can't believe this. Listen, I want to tell you something. Jesus was crucified. Right? But we're not saved by the cross. Jesus was crucified. We're not saved by the implements. See, I want to tell you this again. All of your New Testament theology can be corrected and right if you look at Old Testament theology, typology, prefiguring, the Passover festival. What saved them? Their obedience to take a Passover lamb to build a relationship with it, to kill it at twilight, and then put the blood on their doorpost. It was the blood they were saved by. When the, the death angel came, it seemed the blood of the lamb. It wasn't none of the other actions. Even though they had to do them all in obedience, it was only the blood that saved them from the death angel. The, pa the Passover passes over the punishment, right? So all the other things going on around the cross, surrounding the cross, you can't, you can't look at them. You can't go, well, I believe in the cross. Unless you define what you believe about the cross. Because if they would have been standing there with a knife in their hand and the death angel come and they go, but I killed the lamb with this knife. You were deceived by the devil then and we're going to kill you if you're the firstborn because that's what the plague did. But wait a minute. We picked a lamb and we shared it with our neighbors and, and we all sat down and had a meal. You forgot to put the blood over your doorpost. You're going to die. So you got to keep the focus in the right place. And the devil is a master at tricking us. If you're not building a love relationship with God that's real, it's personal, it's, 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 it's led by the Spirit of God in the Word of God, and it's, it's alive and active, and you're giving testimony and witness of it to others so that they can counsel you. So they can say, wait a minute, Greg, that's not biblical. Wait a minute, Greg, let's sit down and let's talk about this because you're seeing some things that are strange to my ears. <clears throat> well, wait a minute, it's right here in the Bible. See, it's the blood of Jesus. It's the blood. Jesus died on the cross, and then what did he do? The grave couldn't hold him. Where was he at? He was preaching to the captives. Peter tells us he, he poured his blood out on the altar in heaven. See, he was sinless. So the grave couldn't hold him. He took our sins, yes. He became our kinsman redeemer. He was the only one that had pure blood that could actually pay for his brethren. He became our kinsman redeemer. Now, who's his kinsman? Anyone who believes. All of humanity. That's the reason he became flesh. So that he could have the right of redemption. His delight... Proverbs 8 tells us was always with the sons of men. He was raised up as a master craftsman before the Father, but his delight was always with the sons of men, the children of the earth, the creation. He was always coming to pay for you and me, but it was always with the blood. And then once he gave his blood, he could get up out of the grave because it couldn't hold him. It was impossible. There was no sin, and the reward for sin is the grave. The reward for sin is death. The reward for sin is separation. He paid for our sins with his blood. And then he got up. Impossible to hold him. And you know what? Anybody that believes in that blood, it's impossible for you to stay in the grave. You will also go. That's our heavenly hope. You will also go in the resurrection. You will also go in the resurrection. 
That's what, it, that's what the, the text there in Thessalonians was even written about. He said, I do not want you. They were concerned that their, that their loved ones had fallen asleep. They had died. And he said, I do not want you to be uninformed. He uses the word ignorant, but it's not PC, so I won't use it because I'm just totally PC. It just sounds better. I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who have fallen asleep. For the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall meet him in the air. Thus we'll be with him always. And we should testify. We should encourage and exhort one another about these things. See, if he rose, we're going to rise. He's the first fruit to the resurrection. He stood up because he was righteous. You and I have been given that to our account. It's justification. It's imputed to our account. So you and I need to know that we can stand up and be a witness no matter how bad you lived last night. No matter how bad you acted last week. No matter what's going on. You're righteous in Christ Jesus. And as you begin to obey, he's going to begin to speak to you. See, most Christians will sit around and say, I can't say nothing and I really can't obey because I've been disobeyed. What? I remember years ago out witnessing at, at, at a bar over on campus. And my spiritual mother, Lynn Abney, looked at a guy and says, Well, it doesn't matter you're drinking. You just need to come to Jesus. He'll clean you up. And see, we always want to clean ourselves up with our own filthy works. As soon as I stop, I'll come to Jesus. As soon as I stop, I'll tell people about Jesus. Never been a perfect witness except Jesus. Never been a perfect saint except Jesus. Not even Paul. I have not arrived. Yet one thing I do, I forget that which is behind me and I press on toward the higher call of God in Christ Jesus. Pressing on. Now, it's not, for God forbid, like Paul said in Romans, it's not an excuse to sin because our hearts need to be turned toward home. He talked about it being an excuse to sin. Just go back and look at the life of Saul in the Old Testament, the first king. He never turned it around. He had less sin than David, but David is a man after God's own heart because there's none righteous anyway. It's just pursuing God with a heart to do his will, O oh God. Okay, I'm way too off. Let's get back. They crucified him. They put him to death. His, he was raised up. Resurrected. Loosed. From the pains of death. Because it was not possible. It's not capable is what the word means. Not powerful to hold him. A righteous life, the death has no power over it. The grave has no power over it. Hades, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? There's no power over a righteous life there. It's impossible. It's incapable of holding you down. If you've come to Christ, why are you being held down unless you're believing the indictment? Unless you're believing the lies of the devil. You've been set free, and what Christ sets free is free indeed. To go out and be a witness. That's what you're witnessing. That's what you're witnessing. Twitter tell the whole truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, tell God. I do. I was once blind, now I see. Christ died for me. I've been set free. He'll die for you. He did die for you. There's power in the blood. You can be set free too. What testimony are you giving? Let me let's talk about a football game. Let's talk about me. Let's talk about what God did with me, and I'm now I'm a preacher and I got a ministry. Sorry, I'll get in trouble here, won't I? No, if I be lifted up. I will draw every man to myself. The witness and testimony is of Jesus and his finished work of the cross, that his blood was poured out for our sin nature, and that he rose again because he was righteous, because there was no sin in him, because it's the evidence of things not seen. Really? It's the evidence of things not seen. Resurrection. We've got to get into this because there's a whole lot of lies being told about the resurrection out there today. In fact, we're singing about it. We're singing about resurrection power. And that's a deception in the church. Sounds good. Sings good. Think about it. Because I have power of the resurrection. No, no, no. They're singing because I have resurrection power. That's the wrong side of the coin. That's like fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Remember when they came and God or Jesus restored Peter? He said, Cast your net on the other side of the boat. They were backslidden. They 
cast it on the other side of the boat, and man, a big, and Peter didn't even wait to put his old fleshly garment back on, which is what that really represents. He dove in. He said, I'm all in. That's the Lord. He didn't put his outer garment back on. He said, I'm believing it. He was back flitting his all get out. Out in the water fishing again, and he called him away from fishing. Listen to me, because this is going to be a hard one. Paul says in Philippians 3, that I might know Him, Christ Jesus, and the power of His resurrection, fellowship with His sufferings, that by any way I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. He did not say that I might know Jesus and have resurrection power. There's a big difference, and the devil loves to flip stuff upside downward. You'll see it here. It's in the text. It's not Lord. It's not Christ and Lord. It's Lord and Christ. You have to have this right. Listen to me. The power of the resurrection is a righteous life. Paul wanted to understand how to walk in that righteousness and live that life more and more every day. Not to have some power that's on the other side. See, the power is the Holy Spirit that takes the Word of God and washes and cleanses the saint of God as they look to do the will of God. There's not resurrection power. There's the power of the resurrection. The reason Jesus couldn't be held and had to get up was because it was the evidence He was the righteous man. It was the evidence He was the Messiah. It was the evidence that God, by foreknowledge, ordained Him to die for the sins of the world. And it has to be taught that way. If you teach it as resurrection power, now you're putting it on man. Man wanting to use this power to go out and build him a kingdom. But when it's the power of the resurrection, you keep it in the right focus. Because now, see, I've been resurrected. I, because I'm crucified with Christ, now I can get up and live in the flesh and walk about because of the power of the resurrection. But I want to know it more. I want to grow in it every day. I want to come to know Him more every day. And understand what a righteous life looks like. Because I've always lived an unrighteous life. That's what Paul was talking about. He hadn't apprehended. But one thing he did was he forgot what was behind. And he pressed forward. And God was showing him what it meant. Showing him the witness and the testimony of a martyred life. Because that's what he was living. He said, I count it all dumb to the knowledge of Christ and the power of the resurrection. See, through the knowledge of Christ, he could understand what righteousness was because he's the only one that's ever been righteous. And he can understand what power of the resurrection. Listen to me, guys and gals. The more you obey, the more you will, in your own conscience, understand righteousness. But your works don't save you. It's the blood of Jesus and the completed works on the cross. How can we do the works of God? John 6, 29. Believe in Him whom God has sent. That's it. Believe. We've talked about this. We're teaching so many things that are not gospel. You have to go forward to the altar and say a prayer and ask for forgiveness. My Bible says believe. Forgiveness is given in the blood of Jesus. Forgiveness is already given. He died for the sins of the world. You believe that He did and become a witness of it. And as you're witnessing, if you blow it, you say, oh, Lord, I agree. That was wrong, wasn't it? Because the Holy Spirit's there to convict you. Remember Friday night we were studying, and, and David creeps forward and cuts off the, the, the corner of Saul's robe, and instantly the Holy Spirit smacked him on the head. Seriously, it's what it said. Troubled, it meant to strike. Struck his heart. Instantly he knew he was wrong, and he repented. And then he turned around and gave witness to the men with him and said, no. We are not going to kill the Lord's anointed. It was a witness. It was a testimony. Everybody's standing around telling dirty jokes at work. It's a witness and a testimony to walk away. The Holy Spirit should tell you. You don't stand there to be cool in the gang. There's a witness that we are given testimony that we are peculiar people. This is not our home. We're aliens here. Listen to me. I want you to understand that it's not resurrection power. Go to Luke 24 with me. Am I correct? I ain't looking at no notes. Luke, is that? That's backward, right? From Acts. Luke 24. I just want you to see this. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. The resurrection is the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. It has to be taught. It has to be there. But it has to be on the right place, on the right side of the cross. You guys remember this. They've made a whole ministry out of it. The Emmaus Walk. Not picking at it. Just telling you they made a whole ministry out of it. Should have used the whole Bible. Now I'm picking on it. I'm just like that. I'm controversial. Christ was controversial. The church should not settle up for demonic answers. He's on the road to Emmaus. Christ is risen. I believe this is Simon Peter. It's my opinion. I don't know. Somebody could probably prove me wrong if they can translate Greek. I can't. But I want you to look. Hone in on verse 21. Here's the, here's the narrative. They're walking down the street. Jesus comes up. They can't tell who he is. He's resurrected, walking beside them. What's going on? Are you the only stranger you don't know about Jesus Christ who was attested by God with these miracle signs and wonders? Are you, what? And we were hoping, King James, we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. Their hope, their faith was in Jesus. But until he resurrected, there was no evidence. Listen to me. The evidence is in the resurrection. They were trusting. Faith is the substance of things trusted in. The evidence of things not seen. They were hoping in it, but now their, their hope has been lost. They said, oh man, and now they can't. If you, let me just read this story to you. Oh my goodness, I get carried away here and you guys will be like, what's he talking about? 21, we were hoping. Same word that's used in, exact same word except it's translated um, in the King James, it says trusted. We were trusting that he was going to redeem Israel. See, they've been walking around believing that, right? It's the same word that's in Hebrews 11, 1. And it means to expect, to hope, to trust. It's from a word that means to anticipate. It's usually with pleasure and expectation and to have confidence. That's why the, the NIV translates it confidence. Listen. We were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. The Messiah. That's who was coming to redeem. Indeed, besides all that, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart. I mean, yeah. oh, is this kind, benevolent, loving Jesus? <laughs> Not allowed to call people fools. Foolish one and slow of heart to believe. You notice he didn't say to, to repent. He didn't say to, for, to, to ask for forgiveness, to come to the altar. You understand what I'm saying here? We've got to understand this. It's the word pistio. It means to entrust your spiritual well-being into Christ and have a constancy in it. You continue, abide, and remain in it. You don't just do a one-time prayer. In fact, I don't even believe in altars except in your heart. There's no altars in the New Testament. Altars is under the law. Altars is the place to bring dead animals. We're living sacrifices. And that's just my opinion. Why don't do altar calls? If you believe, just get involved. If you believe, just start doing what the Bible says. If you believe, start asking questions. If you believe, ask the Holy Spirit how to use your life for the ministry of reconciliation. But if you believe, don't believe in a cross. The weapon could have been an electric chair. Could have been lethal injection if he'd have died in our day. Believe in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. Because he was righteous, his blood was righteous. Every Old Testament sacrifice was about the blood. You would hold the sacrifice by the neck as the priest cut its throat and the blood ran out on the altar. We cannot make it about a stick and stand around and argue about sticks. No remission of blood without the shedding of, or no remission of sin without the shedding, shedding of blood. 
But God had no, he had no pleasure in, 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 in fat of animals or in dead sacrifices. Now I'm back in Hebrews. Let's get back here in uh, Luke 24, um, 25. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Notice where he always points back to Scripture, back to where we have uh, evidence of what was going on. We have a, a, a Scripture that's being made sure in the New Testament. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Remember in John 17, glorify me with the glory that I had before with you, Father. And beginning at Moses, I'd love to heard this sermon, and all the prophets, that's why I believe it's Simon Peter here in the sermon, the way he stepped right up. He's being equipped here, listening, being equipped. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's why it's all over in the scriptures, beginning with Moses, beginning in Genesis, all the Pentateuch, all the way through. Everywhere you read is about Jesus, and it'll keep you in line if you learn it. You can't jettison it like some pastors are saying. So important that we have one testimony, one testament, one Lord, one Savior, one God in three persons, all in unity, and the body of Christ be in unity. See what he's talking about himself and how he had to go through this, how he was the Messiah. Then they drew near to the village. and See, they still don't know who he is. See, they still don't know who he is. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening. And the day is far spent. And he went on to stay with them. So hospitality. He was going to anyway. He knew what was going on. He's God. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Look at the hope he's given them. Look at the testimony of the resurrected life he's given. See, they were with him. They were with him. But he's kind of making these little cameo appearances so that they will understand that even when they can't see him, he's still there. The, amazing, the most amazing one is with Thomas because they're going to go back and tell everybody this news and Thomas is not there. And Thomas says, and he gets called Doubting Thomas, but all of them said it in another gospel. He says, unless I see with my eyes and touch his scars, with my, I'm not going to believe. So he comes right into the room and goes right to Thomas and says, here, touch, here, see. And Thomas is like, my Lord and my God. Because he knew what he was thinking. He knew who he was because he heard the conversation. See, God is here with us now. He's present now. This is not out of control. Whatever you're going through, the suffering, the pain, the heartache, you go, what is going on? Why is this sickness? Every bit of it is there for you to be a witness and to give testimony that God is good and no matter what goes on, you're still going to serve Him. Notice they still showed hospitality even when they were, it was just built into their heart. They said, oh, don't go away. It's dark. Come on in. It was part of what they did. Hospitality. It's who they are. We don't do this out of works. We don't do this out of tradition. We don't do this out of law. We don't do the, the church witnessing it and trying to save souls because of uh, somebody taught us how to do it other than the Holy Spirit. In fact, listen, the ministry of reconciliation, if you go read Romans 9, Paul said, I am willing to be accursed, anathema, that my countrymen would be saved. That's the heart of Christ, to die so that the other people could be saved. That's supposed to be the heart of a Christian, to die to self daily so that other people can be saved by your witness and testimony. That's the heart of what the Holy Spirit does in a person that understands what's really going on here. That's the fruit of a crucified life. That you give up everything, count it dung, to become a witness for Christ so that you might know him, the power of his resurrection, and go through his sufferings too. Listen, we like to leave that out. That's a crossless gospel. We like to leave out the pain 
of living for Jesus. The world hated him, so they will hate you if you are a witness. It's that simple. If you're given testimony, the accuser of the brethren is going to come to attack you. But don't give up doing what's true for something you don't know about. Keep doing what you know. Stay. We're going to see it next week. Stay in the word, prayer, and fellowship. Live for Jesus. Continue to be a witness no matter what's going on. Trust the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you into all truth. Live a life that has been raised up because Christ rose up. Vanish from their sight. And 32, and they said to one another, one another ministry, they should be talking to one another. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us? Now listen, listen. The Jehovah Witnesses, is it the Jehovah Witnesses use the scripture as the only the burning in the bosom? I'm looking for some help here. Anybody know? Is it the Mormons or the Jehovah Witnesses? My wife's not in the room. I often get them confused. You see the Mormons are changing their name? The them also? Yeah. Don't trust just in a feeling or heartburn to make your decision on whether something's truth or not. That's what they want you to do. When we were talking to you about scriptures, isn't there a burning? And they use this one scripture to get people to believe. Oh, it's the Mormons. They get, use this one scripture to get people to believe that what they're talking about is true. And they're from the pit of hell. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They didn't wait. They went to, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem means teaching peace. And found the eleven... Those, were, those who were with them and gathered together, they had fellowship and they gave the study. When they learned something from Jesus and they told people. They went that very hour and shared as a witness what they had learned. That's what we're doing here. We're being equipped. Own up to it. Go out and tell somebody what you heard. Every, every Monday morning I ask the guys that work with me, what did you learn in church yesterday? Music was good. I'm like, are you kidding me? What did this sermon about? You were there to be equipped to be a child of God, to tell people the glory of God, and you heard the song and that was it? See, that's the culture we live in. We want to just be entertained. I'm not being mean to anybody. I'm just talking about how shipwrecked we are in the apostate church of today. And God's always got a remnant, and we have to make a decision what we're going to do. They went straight out and were witnesses. 34, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. I think that's Simon Peter. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them because of the burning in the bosom. How he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. He's the bread of life. Listen, break the bread. Sit down and have a fellowship meal with him, and he will become known to you when you sit down. He says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's at the church door. If anyone will hear my voice, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Anyone hear my voice and open the door. Let's believe. I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Let's go back to our text. Listen, resurrection is the evidence that the blood payment was pure and righteous and holy. It's not possible that Jesus could be held by the grave. Hell cannot keep him. In fact, I believe he went and preached to the captives and some 500 saints got up with him when they believed. It was made more sure. And then he gives scripture to back up what we're talking about, Acts 2.25. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart 
rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Hades or in hell, the King James says, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption, decay, destroy. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Joy in the Lord. And then he expounds. The Holy Spirit gives us this, this, this uh, um, commentary on what he's talking about right there in that text. Um, which is Psalm 16, 8 to 11. He says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. He possibly pointed to where his tomb was. His tomb is in the city of Jerusalem. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Messiah, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed, to sit on the throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, nor did his flesh see corruption. No ruin. It did not perish. Now let's just go back and look at this because I did it and I was amazed by it because David understood it evidently and wrote it down. Or maybe he didn't understand it. It's 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. You guys remember this. Remember David said to um, Nathan, the prophet, We all drill in cedar houses and great places. I want to build a temple for the Lord. And Nathan said, do whatever's in your heart, David. The Lord is with you. And listen, just because you can don't mean you should. You need to ask God. Nathan, the prophet, didn't ask God. So he goes home, and at night in a vision, he's told, no, there's blood on his hands. He cannot build me a temple. He says, go back and tell him this, and tell him this also. It's, it's seven... Um, Or excuse me, 712. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, his tomb is with them, I will set up your seed, notice seed, it's not plural, after you, speaking of Christ, who will come from your body, flesh, what we're hearing Peter explain, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, spiritual house. Now listen, it's, it's dual. It's a dual prophecy because Solomon builds a temple, came from <coughs> David's flesh. Dual prophecy. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now notice, Solomon's kingdom didn't last forever. All right? See, but that's why they believed it. See, well, the reason they believed so many lies in Israel, because the false teachers, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the ones that went to Hebrew high and said they were the ruling authorities, told them that the Messiah was going to come and restore the nation of Israel to the days of Solomon. Forever. His throne was going to be forever. And they misunderstood the spiritual ramifications of the Messiah coming, and it's his throne that's going to last forever. There'll be no end. And that's how you get mixed up and teach fables instead of truth. And you miss the Messiah when he comes with a bad exegesis of the scriptures. Fourteen, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Should be capitalized. It's not because even the, the printers didn't know. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. Listen, there was no sin in him. He was righteous, but he took our pain. He was chastened with the rod of men he, for us, for you and me. But that's not the point. The blood is the point. The grave couldn't hold him is the point. God doesn't dwell on the beating. God doesn't dwell on the blows from the sons of men that he took before he went to the cross. He dwells on the blood and the resurrection. Because it's the evidence that the blood was accepted. Fifteen. 
but my mercy shall not depart from him. He's sitting on that throne of grace, meeting out mercy and grace to help in time of need right now. My mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Then the king, then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? Listen to me. Testimony and witness. That's why the radio program that shares my scriptures is called Who Am I? Who am I that God has brought me even this far in my wretched life that's saved by grace? To pull us out of a pit. Because we simply believe that he come to earth and took flesh and died. That's enough. He doesn't have to do anything else for us. And yet he makes us joint heirs. And yet he makes us his bride. And yet he's, he's, he's building us a house. Yet he's going to let us sit at his table. Yet he's going to let us rule and reign and be rewarded in the millennial kingdom with him. I mean, think about the things that are going on. And when we deserve death. You see, the, his audience here knows a whole lot more than the church today knows. His audience here are trained in the Old Testament scriptures. So when he's preaching to them, they're, you're going to see that they're cut to the quick. You're going to see that they're cut to the heart. You're going to see that they're ready to say, what can we do? Because this type of glorious gospel should cause us to want to repent, to change our mind, to turn the other way. To go in the direction of God. 32. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Notice what he's doing right now. He's being a witness. He's waving his hand. We are all witnesses. Us 120 here that's up in the upper room. We've been waiting for the promise. And now we are all given testimony as we stand here of what's going on. You crucified the Lord of glory. You handed him over to Roman soldiers and he died. But he did not stay in the grave. He got up because his righteous life could not be held. And he, while he was doing that, he was preaching to the captives and he poured his blood out on the altar in heaven. And the father brought down the gavel and said, forgiven to Telestai, paid in full. And all who believe become believer priests. What do priests do? They do the work of the ministry with the priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father now, the place of power, giving testimony. He's praying. Listen, they used to have the witness booth on the right side of the judge. It's on the left side now. See, the world is full of ways to corrupt the Bible. We, we flip everything to the wrong side. The same way the resurrection powers on the wrong side, so is the witness of the church. It's on the wrong side. It's listening to the wrong person. We're witnessing about all the food kitchens and all the sociology and all the things we're doing to change a neighborhood when we should be looking to bring people into reconciliation with Almighty God one soul at a time. If that changes a neighborhood, if that starts a food pantry, if that changes a neighborhood, whatever it does, Leave that up to the Holy Spirit with that soul. But if you start preaching from the other side of that, you end up with man's works and man's house, and you end up leading people to hell and making them twice the sons of hell, just like the Pharisees and Sadducees were doing when Jesus came and they missed him. And he says in John 1 there, 10 and 11, he came to his own, his brother and his sister, and the ones he came to save. And they did not know him. But to as many as know he came to his own and they did not receive him. But to as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. His name is his character, his nature, and his will. His name is that written document. His will for the planet. His testimony. It's amazing stuff. 
Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. So he, so he went from, this is what's going on. Here is an indictment against you if you want to accuse somebody of something. Let me tell you what you truly did, who he truly is. And then he went back again and said, hey, this is what you see. He gave an offense again. And notice what he says, you see and hear. Listen, when a person has the promise of the Holy Spirit upon them and they're born again, you will see it in their life, you will hear it in their life. As long as it's true biblical salvation, you're going to see it and hear it. There's no way about it, no two ways about it. But notice where it came from. I, I love this. It's, it's actually great stuff. Verse 33 there. Jesus said, I will send you another in John 16. It's, it's the same one. Spirit of truth, whom the world does not know, but you know, and he'll be with you, and he'll be in you. Notice where he got the Spirit from, from the Father. Everything flows from the Father. It's his Father's house. One day he's going to lay the entire church down at his Father's feet. We're told in 1 Corinthians, no, 2 Corinthians 14, maybe? No, there ain't even 14 chapters in uh, It's in Corinthians when he's talking about death, where is your victory? Hades, where is your sting? And every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Our salvation comes from the Father of lights, from his plan to send the Messiah. It was his foreknowledge and predetermined counsel on his will. Jesus just came to do his will. And when we become uh, saints and, and, and baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit of God to the Spirit which we cry, Abba, Father, then we are supposed to be doing the will. We're supposed to be doing His predetermined written will of witnessing to others and telling them about Jesus, the testimony of the Messiah. You want to know evidence? It's the resurrection. The grave is empty. But it's His blood that the power is in. And if we get on the wrong side of the cross, it's like fishing on the wrong side of the boat, and it's dead faith. It's demonic faith. It's faith does not have any evidence on the other side. And you don't find out till you get to the throne room on Judgment Day unless you get involved, unless you start reading the Word and draw near to God, unless you begin to listen to the Holy Spirit Test it through the word of God. Test it through the teaching of the scripture and what it says. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Quoting Psalms 110.1. Kurios said to Kurios. Some text says Kurios said to Adonai. But his supreme and authority said to supreme and authority. David was writing as a prophet by the spirit. He didn't know what he was saying. Or did he? If he was talking with God, he might have known. Kurios said to Kurios. Supreme in authority. Set at my right hand. That's where Jesus is at. Till I make your enemies, the enemies of the cross. That's going to that's going to be poured out in the day of the Lord. He's going to punish all the sons of disobedience. Therefore, let all the house of Israel, all those governed by God, know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Notice the position. Lord and Christ. Why is it like that? It's so important. Before he died, he was Jesus Christ. Jesus was his name. The Lord is salvation, Yeshua. Christ was his mission. That's what he was there for. After he died, now when your Bible says Jesus Christ, do it should say Christ Jesus. Because he's no longer that man in the flesh. Now he's the Messiah. Now in the first sermon, what does Peter tell us? He's kurios and Christ. Christ is over with, even though he's still saving. But he came to be the Messiah. Now he's been given all authority on heaven and earth. And he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen to me. He 
is the Messiah. He was the Messiah. But now the important title is, is that he's kurios. All authority has been given to him. You can trust him. He's resurrected. He's righteous. He's given you his righteousness to walk in. And then he's training us in righteousness as we don't become sinless, but we do sin less as we follow him and agree. Because why? He's washing us and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. If we're allowing him, if we're staying in his hand. That should, and unfortunately I'm going to have to close because I'm about an hour and a half. And um, That should cut our hearts, should cut us to the quick. When we hear it. And that's what we're supposed to do as witnesses is tell other people this. And it, if the Holy Spirit's working, because see, the Holy Spirit's there. That's the only reason Peter could preach like that. And tell them all of this. It cuts hearts. It meets the conscience. And then the free will has to make a decision. Am I going to keep playing culturanity? Or am I going to become a witness, a martyr? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. For what? The only thing that's left to do. Live a resurrected life. Because we're no longer dead. If you really believe in Jesus, you're not dead anymore. You've been given life. He is life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when you get life, you're resurrected from your dead sin nature. And you're given a new nature that now positionally you're finished. Practically, you're walking out the middle of the race. One day we'll be glorified and we'll see him face to face the same way he did when he said, Father, glorify me. And bring me back to the place I was in the beginning with you. Right hand. The place Stephen saw him when he was testifying first martyr of the church that literally died physically for witness and testimony. You see how they reacted? Gnashed at him with their teeth and stoned him to death because of his testimony. There's two ways to react. Next week we'll see that 3,000 people get saved. Notice that the text is a little different than what your gospel usually teaches you. It says repent and be baptized. For, really it means to repent, turn, because you believe, and then go and obey, which is the first works of baptism, because of the remission of sins. That's what it really means. Since your sins have been blotted out, you should change your mind. Metanoia is what the word is for repentant. It means to change your mind, change your direction, turn to God. You don't just turn away from sin. You have to turn to God. You have to turn to his truth, to his will, to his written document, and begin to follow and obey him. And when you do, he'll draw near to you. Father, we give you praise. What a sermon Peter preaches by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, wake us up. We sleep the sleep of death. As Paul says to the Ephesians, that we arise, that you would give us light that we would walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, for the days are evil, and that we would know what your will is, and we would be always be being filled with the Holy Spirit of promise. Move in a mighty way in our lives, Lord, that we would never be the same because of meeting you, that people would see and hear that you are a mighty God and that you have risen. You have risen indeed. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for paying for our sin nature that our reward was death. And now you've given us a new nature, the nature of your son, the righteous one. Thank you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless you.